Colorectal cancer is the second leading cause of cancer death in the United States, among men and women combined. Colorectal cancer screening can save lives, but only if people get tested. The goal of the 80% in every community campaign is to reach 80% and higher screening rates in communities across the nation. This is what 80% in every community means to our members and partners. The goal is to try to have 80% of Americans screen for colorectal cancer. 80% in every community means uh, life safe. It's knowing that patients will be around to spend time with their grandchildren, to spend time with their loved ones. To me, that's the most important thing. For me, 80% in every community means breaking down all the barriers to access uh, for colorectal cancer screening. 80% in every community means to me serving those who are underserved, under-resourced, and underfunded. 80% in every community means working hard and passionately to try to help uninsured people get screened, giving everyone the chance to have their colon cancer detected early or prevented. 80% in every community means to me that, again, there's one less cancer diagnosis that I'm going to give that day to a patient. It's one less life that is forever changed by a preventable cancer. It's preventable, it's treatable, it's beatable. It means the fact that the people I love and care about get to live longer and I get to see them live a long life. 80% in every community means that we do the right thing for every person every single time. To get to 80% in every community, we need to offer a diverse group of options for screening. I'm really excited to see how industry, all of our cross-functional partners come together to really put that message out there. So essential for groups like the National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable to offer inspiration and a reason for the GI community to do their best work to help screen and prevent for colorectal cancer. 80% in every community means that we're going to reach a goal of at least 80% screening across all populations. It's a goal that's achievable, it's a goal that can help save lives, and it's a goal that I think collectively, as a community, we can all work together. Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Caitlin Sylvester with the American Cancer Society National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to our program today. We are here to celebrate March, National Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month, and to recognize all of the great work that's being done with the 80% Every Community Campaign, which aims to reach and exceed the colorectal cancer screening rates of 80% or higher in communities across the nation. We have a very special program lined up for you today. Um, will show us a nice slide with our agenda. But before we get started, I want to let you know that this webcast is being recorded and a replay will be posted to our website in just a couple of days. We're also hoping to periodically break into questions. So throughout the program, if you have any questions, please feel free to add them to the Q&A box. We'll do our best to get to all of them. And as a quick reminder, be sure to engage us on social media by using the hashtag 80 in every community. We want to hear about all the exciting work you're doing this March and obviously throughout the year. So with that, I am now pleased to pass to ACS NCCRT Director, Emily Bell. Hello everyone. I'm thrilled to have so many of you with us today for the ninth year of our annual March webcast. To kick us off, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Stephen Itzkowitz, a GI leader at Mount Sinai in New York and chair of the National Collective Cancer Roundtable. So Steve, please come on camera and join us. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, much for being here today. <laughs> Thank you, Emily, and welcome everyone. Uh, we're always excited in the month of March, Colon Cancer Awareness Month, to share our progress towards 80% in every community. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, the National Colon Cancer Roundtable is the longest running roundtable from the American Cancer Society. We're in our 28th year, and we really couldn't get here without all the hard work and bold initiatives from all of our members and partners. Uh, we've made a huge amount of progress in recent years in terms of policy, increasing screening, and you'll see some of that data today. Um, so I just wanna thank you all for sharing your time uh, and you have a lot to look forward to in this uh, next hour. Great, and how exciting that we have such a great turnout with so many partners joining us today. We reached over 400 registrants, and it looks like we have just over 200 participants joining us already. 
Um, so Steve, talk to us about what the landscape for colorectal cancer screening looks like this year. So you're probably all aware that we have done a really good job in increasing screening rates, and I think we should all be proud of that. And you're going to hear some of that shortly. But we also have to be cognizant of the fact that there's still a lot of challenges that we face. By lowering the screening age to 45, that put a lot of people into the denominator for screening. Uh, so there's a lot more work that has to be done. In our feder federally qualified health centers that serve over 30 million people um, who are underserved in the healthcare community, uh, we're still seeing rates of about 43% overall. And those rates are a little bit lower than they were before the COVID pandemic. So we still are very aware of this and trying to increase those rates as well. We also know about lower screening rates and people who uh, have uh, either lower education levels, lower income levels, uh, insurance status. And we're painfully aware of disparities when it comes to the Asian American community, American Indians, Alaskan Natives, African American and Black individuals. And we've tried to highlight a lot of those uh, communities in the work that we do and at the annual meetings. Um, the other thing is that the early age onset is really becoming a huge concern. Um, the increase in colon cancer rates in people younger than 50 uh, is, has been going up for several decades. And it's now uh, at a point where and you look, if you look at individuals younger than 50, colon cancer is number one amongst men and number two amongst women. Uh, this is a worrisome concern uh, and served as the impetus for some of our recent initiatives like our lead time messaging guidebook, which you'll hear more about. And if you should always go to our resource page on the, uh, on the website. You're gonna hear from Rebecca Siegel in, momentarily about some of the latest statistics and Rebecca always keeps us grounded in data. So uh, we look forward to that. Uh, but let me just finish by saying that uh, we face all of these challenges, but we can do it because we all work together. Uh, last year at the annual meeting, we had an enormous amount of energy uh, we, and we now have surpassed over 217 member organizations who can help us in our national effort to get to 80%. Uh, so I'll turn it back over to Emily. Great, thank you for sharing that landscape with us. Um, and in terms of the NCCRT's areas of focus, would you remind us of our priorities for this year? Yeah, so the NCCRT has certain priority areas and uh, they're listed here on the slide. So the first is to mobilize national and community level efforts that will lead to health equity in colon cancer screening. The second is to support on-time screening as soon as eligible and to continue uh, with continued participation according to the screening recommendations. And the third is to time to promote timely colonoscopy follow-up for a positive or an abnormal stool test. So those three priorities are big areas, but by working together, we think we'll be able to make progress in all of these areas. And I'm optimistic. Great, thank you so much, Steve. Um, and be sure to keep an eye on the chat. We'll be posting links to things like our comprehensive strategic plan, that lead time messaging guide, and other resources and tools that will be relevant as we um, go through the program. So before we move to our next presentation, one of our favorite things in March is seeing all the energy and excitement around the country. I know I always love seeing the Dress of Blue Day pictures and all the things uh, posted to social media. So be sure to share about the work you're doing on social media using hashtag 80 in every community and we'll be sure to amplify your efforts. So Steve, thank you again. We always learn so much from you. Um, and now it's my pleasure to welcome Rebecca Siegel, Senior Scientific Director of Surveillance Research with the American Cancer Society. Rebecca is known for her groundbreaking research on trends in early age onset colorectal cancer, and in 2018 became the inaugural recipient of the National Colorectal Award for Distinguished Research. Um, if time allows, we plan to break for a couple of questions for Rebecca before moving on to our next panel. So please go ahead and submit your questions for Rebecca at any time through the Q&A box. Rebecca, thank you again for taking the time to be with us today. I'll pass the mic to you to share with us some of the latest data on colorectal cancer screening, incidence, and mortality. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Emily, um, so much for inviting me back and um, all of the NCCRT staff. I love this group. And I'm always excited to be here to share um, information on cancer occurrence in the U.S. So um, 
I will go ahead and get started. All of the information that I'm going to share today is from American Cancer Society research publications, and you can find all of this information if you're interested in more details um, at cancer.org backslash statistics. So please check this out. And we also have a, a very cool interactive website called the Cancer Statistics Center. It went through a complete rebuild last year and you can go here and get customized data on colorectal cancer incidence, mortality, survival, and even um, risk factor and screening prevalence. So you can go here, um, show uh, your figures in uh, map form for presentations. So please check this out as well and give us feedback. Let us know uh, how we can improve the site. So um, as Steve mentioned, the US really boasts, I would say the best progress in colorectal cancer in the world. We've had declines in both incidence and mortality year over year for decades. For incidence, there's been an overall drop of 46% since 1985. Uh, rates have declined um, for longer for mortality with an overall drop of 57% since 1970. And this is because of changing patterns in risk factors like less smoking, um, more people using anti-inflammatory drugs, as well as, of course, the increase in screening and improvements in treatment for mortality. The pace of these declines was most rapid during the 2000s when colonoscopy uptake was rapidly increasing and has since slowed, especially for incidents. We're expecting uh, to be uh, to see about 153,000 cases of colorectal cancer diagnosed in the U.S. this year, and more than 53,000 deaths. And that translates to 145 deaths every day in this country from colorectal cancer. So it's a really solemn reminder of the fact that despite all this progress, there's a lot more work to do and highlights the importance of organizations like the Roundtable in working to um, improve this situation. In terms of new cases being diagnosed, there's going to be more than 20,000 cases this year in people in their 40s and younger, and 45% of new diagnoses will be in people younger than 65. This is up from just 27% in 1995, and it's because of both increasing incidence in younger ages and um, the success of cancer prevention in the older age groups. So you can really see those trends clearly here. Um, these are incidence rates broken out by age. Rates, uh, as Steve mentioned, have been increasing in people actually under the age of 55 by one to 2% per year since the mid 90s. And this is at the same time of steep declines in older age groups. Interestingly, in people middle age, 50 to 64, the pattern mirrored the older age group before 2010, but now there's been an abrupt change and the pattern is becoming more similar to the younger age groups. And the reason here is because the increase in incidence isn't in young adults per se, but it's in people born after the 1950s. And so some of those people born in the 1950s, like me, I was born in the mid 60s, I have aged into this middle age group and I have elevated risk. We're carrying that with us and we're changing these trends. As a result, the um, number of people diagnosed in their early 50s or younger was just one in 10 in 1995. Today, that proportion has doubled to 20% or one in five. In addition to younger age at diagnosis, there's also a trend toward more advanced disease, which is really concerning. This slide shows incidence trends by stage at diagnosis for those same age groups. And 
advanced disease, which is regional or distant stage, are shown in orange and yellow. And you can see that in both age groups under 65, incidence rates are increasing for regional and distant stage disease. And even in older adults, steep declines for advanced diagnoses have stabilized in recent years. So as a result, the most common diagnosis today, surprisingly, is for regional stage or stage three disease. Advanced stage diagnosis was diagnosed in about half of patients in the mid 2000s, again, meaning regional or distant stage. But today there are three in five newly diagnosed patients with advanced disease. And this is surprising because in 2019, 57% of Americans uh, 45 and older reported being current for screening. The other shift, as Steve um, noted, is this um, rapid shuffling in the leading causes of death in people under 50. Um, this slide shows the number of deaths and the trend since 1975. In the late 90s, Colorectal cancer was the fourth most common cause of cancer death in both men and women under 50. Today, it's the leading cause of death in men under 50 and second in women after breast cancer, which still leads by more than 2,000 deaths. Now I'm going to shift from talking about trends to another area of deep concern, which is racial disparities in colorectal cancer incidence and mortality. The highest rates by far are in native Alaskan people. These are not only the highest in the US, but they're the highest in the world. The rates are two and a half times higher for incidence and mortality compared to white people and three times higher than rates in Asian American and Pacific Islanders. The second highest rates for incidence are in Native Alaskans, Native Americans outside of Alaska. And uh, Native Americans also have the second highest mortality rates um, tied with Black people. In addition, I wanted to mention Alaska Native people are the only group who have not had progress in incidence and mortality. You saw the long-term progress that we've seen in the US overall among Alaska Native people, both incidence and mortality rates are stable. The burden in Native American people is really exacerbated by the steepest increase in early onset disease as shown in this slide particularly among Alaska Native people. Since the mid 2000s, incidence rates have doubled in Alaska Native people under 50 and mortality rates have increased by 60%. So there's a big opportunity here um, with these racial disparities uh, to increase screening uptake and narrow that, uh, that gap. So this slide shows uh, up-to-date screening overall, which is about 59% in people um, 45 and older, according to self-report. But the lowest screening prevalence is in Native American, Hispanic, and Asian American people, 50 to 52%. So only about half of these groups are current for screening compared to 61% of black and white people. One thing that's very notable though, is those groups that have the lowest overall screening uptake have the highest rates of stool testing. And this is an opportunity because it, uh, we can increase screening rates in these groups, I believe, by increasing awareness of stool testing because a lot of times it's pref preferred, but it's not a, recommend, a recommendation from physicians. And so increasing awareness of that opportunity for stool testing among average risk people, of course. 
Um, and screen stool testing is also underutilized in younger age groups, people in, the, in 45 to 49 and their early 50s who are just beginning screening have a low absolute risk of the disease and they're perfect candidates for stool testing. A lot of times these people who are younger age are in mid-career, they have children living at home, so they're busy and the convenience of stool testing is really attractive. Um, I also wanted to point out here right now, we only have 20% of people 45 to 49 current for uh, colorectal cancer screening in 2021. And this number um, stayed flat from 2019. So no progress there. And this slide shows the variation by state in screening uptake. So this is um, screening it at ages 45 to 54. In Idaho and New Mexico, only 30% of people in that age group have had colorectal cancer screening. And it, and it goes up to 47% in DC and 50% in Puerto Rico, but those numbers still aren't high enough, right? Um, in seven states, a third or less of people 45 to 54 are current for screening. And this includes our two most populous states, Texas and California. Similarly, if we look at uh, screening prevalence by state overall in ages 45 and older, we see a similar gap with um, screening prevalence only 53% in California and going up to 70% in Massachusetts and DC. So to summarize, although we have had great progress against colorectal cancer, we cannot deny that. This country should be very proud of that progress, but there are a lot of concerning trends and issues that we need to address. One of these is a much younger patient population in addition to more advanced disease, and also the stark disparities in incidence, mortality, and screening that I showed. So I really think that we need to take a hard look at the recommendations for screening in terms of what providers are recommending, because most commonly colonoscopy is being recommended, but stool testing is also a recommended option from both the ACS and the USPSTF, and it might be preferred to many groups. I'd like to thank cancer registrars across the country for allowing this uh, work to be possible, and also my collaborators on this project. And I think we have some time for questions. Hey, thank you so hey, much, Rebecca. We always learn so much from you. Now we do have um, just a couple minutes to take one or two questions from our viewers. So please you know, go ahead and um, share your questions in the chat. Um, I have, I'll start with an initial one as, as they're trick trickling in. I know we've had, you know, so many um, meetings around trying to understand the reason behind the trends in early age onset disease but the newer trend that we're learning about in advanced disease, I'm curious to know if there are any theories yet as to why we might be seeing more advanced disease or if there are particular research projects investigating that new statistic. Yeah, that's a great question. And partly it's screening saturation, right? We, we've gotten to a point um, in the general population that's uh, similar to screening rates for breast cancer and cervical cancer. So we're probably almost at uh, as high as we're going to get for, I would not include the 45 to 49 year age group in that because they've just been introduced into this um, screening eligibility. But uh, in terms of people 50 and older, um, there's probably not a lot more uh, a lot more space there to increase screening. And so um, a lot of the progress we saw was the increased uptake of colonoscopy and now we've stabilized. And so that's part of it, but it's also partly because uh, younger 
adults are more likely to be diagnosed with advanced disease in part because of the lower screening rates. So, um, but it's something that definitely needs to be investigated. And um, again, I think is an opportunity um, for more stool testing. Great, thank you so much. We have time just for one more question. We have two, one of which I'll save for our, our closing panel. Um, but one we have here is a question, is there data separated out by different um, Asian ethnicities? Uh, that is a great question, and we actually have a new Facts and Figures publication uh, coming out in May that shows data. We have very, very limited data for uh, Asian subgroups, a couple of the larger Asian subgroups, no screening data um, for Pacific Islander people, but um, please look for that publication the beginning of May and we will be covering um, all cancer uh, incidents and mortality, including colorectal cancer, and also have screening in there. That's fantastic. Well, we'll keep an eye out for it and share it with all of our members and partners and probably um, ask for <laughs> to bring you back on at some point to share us, with us that data too. So thank you so much, Rebecca. I really appreciate you being on. Fantastic. Thank you, Emily. You. So now we're going to shift gears to showcase some of the great work that's happening around the country to increase colorectal cancer screening. First, we'll hear from Dr. Janaba Joseph, Branch Chief of the Division of Cancer Prevention and Controls Program Services Branch at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Hey. Oh, apologies. I, <laughs> I thought my video was on and having trouble with my, my button freezing today. <laughs> So um, again, first we'll hear from Dr. Janaba Joseph, branch chief of the Division of Cancer Prevention and Controls Program Services Branch at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, the CCRT was established in 1997 in partnership with the CDC, and we've been pleased to work closely with our partners in the agency throughout our, our now three-decade history. And then next we'll hear from three of our 2024 80% in every community national achievement award honorees that were announced just last week. Um, so Janama, thank you so much for joining us today. Could you share with us a bit about the work that CDC is doing to promote colorectal cancer screening? Sure, thanks for having us today. Um, you know, I'd like to say CDC continues to support our CRCCP recipients in engaging with communities and partners and providers to implement evidence-based interventions that have been proven to increase col colorectal cancer screening. Um, we're happy to say that after the first two years of our current round of CRCCP, um, the mean percentage of people age 50 to 75 at partner clinics that were up to date actually increased 3.63 percentage points, um, which may not seem like much, but that actually happened while COVID was raging in the background. Um, so that we feel like that's quite an accomplishment. Um, beyond the CRCCP, nearly all of our national comprehensive cancer control programs um, also have work plans that include colorectal cancer um, goals and objectives that include working with our CRCCP recipients um, to advance but not duplicate efforts. Um, so we have some exciting initiatives, including uh, implementing things from the ACS's Community Engagement Guidebook. Um, one example is engaging with members of the faith community to create tailored messaging about the importance of screening. So lots of work. Yeah, that's exciting to hear. And especially that 3% that increase is fantastic. Um, so we've hosted several of the CRCCP recipients on our programs over the years, and we always learn so much from them. Are there any recent examples of success that you'd like to share with us? Yeah, we have quite the laundry list of successes. Unfortunately, I cannot squeeze them all into 60 seconds. Um, but just to name a few, um, the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium partnered with the Bristol Bay Area Health Corporation as they reopened and reaccredited their endoscopy unit and they implemented evidence-based interventions to support screening with fit in addition to colonoscopy. And as a result, they increased their screening prevalence from 37 to 50%. Um, so that was very successful. Um, West Virginia University partnered with a clinic that serves people experiencing all sorts of Barriers to screening, poverty, lack of insurance, housing insecurity, substance use disorders, language and health literacy um, 
barriers and demonstrated how they could still, in spite of all of that, um, increase fit return rates from 10% to 58.3% by implementing interventions that they know work. Um, I can't leave without mentioning the University of Missouri who used some friendly competition. Um, so the winning clinic who claimed the golden poop trophy, because I don't know anybody who wouldn't want the golden poop trophy um, <laughs> to have as their bragging rights. Um, and I could probably go on forever, but um, we'll leave it with those with those examples to start. <laughs> That's fantastic. A little humor can go a long way. I'd love to see that trophy at some point. Um, so thank you so much, Navas. And now I'm excited to share with you about the great work of our five 2024 80% Every Community National Achievement Award honorees. Um, the awards program is in its ninth year and it's quite competitive. The honorees represent a diverse group of organizations and individuals, including a community health center, health system, individual champion, and others. And we have representatives from three of these organizations here with us today, but be before we hear from them, we'd like to share a bit about the other two organizations. So first up, we have uh, Family Health Services, which is a community health center located in South Central Idaho. They serve over 30,000 patients in an eight county rural area through 11 locations, and they were able to increase their screening rates from 18% to 56%. Um, between 2015 and January of this year, with some um, clinics and providers reaching 60 or 75 percent. Um, they credit you know, multiple strategies for helping them achieve the success, including an innovative program that fundraises um, over $25,000 a year for discount colonoscopies from referral partners. And you can learn more about them on our, our website. I think the link will be dropped in the chat. And then the other awardee um, is Unity Medical Center a health system located in North Dakota with locations in Grafton and Park River. They serve over 20,000 patients as a nonprofit critical access hospital with primary care clinics. They increased their screening rate in just about a year from 41% to 69%. They also used multiple evidence-based interventions focusing on uh, partnerships and reaching out to their community um, and also included some fun in there as well with a Battle of the Buns baking competition. So again, you know, we'd love for you to learn more about this work um, on our website, and we're hoping to do more in-depth blog interviews with each of our awardees throughout the, the next year. So congratulations to each of these organizations for their inspiring work to increase creating the communities they serve. And now I'm thrilled to introduce three people live with us today to represent our awardees. Um, so please feel free to come off camera for, um, first we have Dr. Jennifer Maloku representing this year's grand prize honoree in the cancer program category, the Southwest Coalition for Closure Cancer Screening Program, which is referred to as the SUCCESS program. And then we have Dr. Christopher Kogel of the Florida Agency for Healthcare Administration, our honoree in the state government agency category, and Makisha Longhi, a closure cancer survivor and public health nurse at the Quinton Inn Burdick Memorial Healthcare Facility of the Indian Health Service and champion for closure cancer screening as a member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Reservation. So congrats all around. Um, Jennifer, would you start by sharing with us a bit about the success program and the community you serve in West Texas? Thank you so much for having me. So our success program is located in El Paso, Texas, but we serve an area of West Texas that covers about um, seven other counties. We are funded by the Cancer Prevention Research Institute of Texas and are located um, at the Texas Tech University Health Science Center. We serve a population that covers about 1.5 million people. Uh, our population is largely Hispanic, uh, passes about 83% Hispanic, um, about 23% are uninsured, we're close to 40 plus if you add underinsured individuals in this group, and about 22% of our population leave, live under the poverty level. Thank you. And would you also share with us a bit about strategies you employ to reach such a large population and what kind of results you're seeing? So our program um, implemented several evidence-based interventions, including the use of navigators, community health outreach workers, who are known as promotoras in our location, a primary fit-based testing where we use two testing out in the population. It was very community-based where we have our outreach workers who were going out into the community to reach people where they lived, worked, prayed, 
um, we worked with a lot of community partners and developed a great relationship with our communities. This allowed us to introduce people with or without access to primary care into screening and our navigators were able to um, work them through the system to make sure that they completed their screening. It also helped that we had funds through CIPRITS to provide no cost screening for individuals who were either uninsured or underinsured. That is phenomenal. Thank you, Jennifer. And Chris, would you share with us a bit about the Florida Agency for Healthcare Administration and how your organization came to focus on colorectal cancer screening? Yes, certainly. And first, I want to say thank you for the honor and thank you for your work that you do for our patients and families. So I'm the Chief Medical Officer for Florida Medicaid. My job is to improve the health of 5 million low-income Floridians. I'm also a medical oncologist and a professor at the University of Florida, where my team had figured out that we need to screen for colorectal cancer at a one and a half fold higher rate than before the pandemic to not only just resume screening, but also to catch up on loss screening. So for, 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 for Medicaid recipients that are living in poverty, screening for cancer is way behind food, shelter, safety, child health, job security. And so for us to achieve this national goal of colorectal cancer screening and to redouble our screening efforts amidst this, this real world challenge, we thought to enlist the partnership of our, our Medicaid managed care health plans. They have experience in addressing health related social needs uh, in addition to healthcare delivery. We also enlisted exact sciences who had the capacity to manufacture, manufacture the stool test Cologuard for a large state intervention. Of course, the American Cancer Society for helping us with uh, design, the design of the intervention. And then lastly, uh, the CDC Division of Cancer who uh, gave us feedback in the progress. That is exciting, thank you. And would you also like to share a bit about the strategies you're using to reach individuals across the state and, and what kind of results you're seeing today? Yes, yeah, certainly. So if I could uh, have slide uh, my slide presented here. So first, the first thing we did is we had to, we had to invent a new policy, a new healthcare financing policy, which is called alleviation of liquidated damages. And what this does is it incentivizes the managed care health plans in the state to strengthen or create new business operations that lead to cancer screening. So so it's a two stage process. First the managed care plans have to increase their rate of cancer screening. So they all started off um, on average around 40 to 45, or 35 to 47%. We required that all of them get up to 50% or greater by a certain time. And if they could do that, they then qualified for dollar discounts, which you can see here is in the gray box. And here's where the American Cancer Society was helpful in on this point system. So we gave some points for fit testing, a little more points for Cologuard because it, th that result will last longer, three years, compared to the one year fit testing. But if they underwent colonoscopy, they get even more points because of the prevention aspect of, of colonoscopy. Uh, and so what we did is we held bi-weekly video conferences where we went over the data for uh, on, on progress for each of the plans. If I could have the next slide up. And so, so every uh, other week, we would meet with all the plans. We would also have uh, our private partners like Exact Sciences in on the call where we shared data on how many people were screened every other week. So this is uh, essentially real-time data that we were sharing on cancer screening throughout this progress. And you can see a steady uh, increase over the time. You can see one of the health plans here that had a huge jump and colorectal cancer screening when they changed a business operation that led to this. Uh, and, there, and so what we learned here in, in terms of durable changes is that uh, there were business operations and cross-pollination in these meetings that led to these effective screenings. And in terms of uh, uh, screen individuals, in summary, we brought 85,000 low-income Floridians up to date on colorectal screen screening which is a six percentile point increase in a nine month period. 85,000, that is phenomenal. Thank you for that, sure, sharing about this great work. Um, 
And Makisha, as a public health nurse, much of your day-to-day -day work centers around colorectal cancer screening, but for this, um, for you, this work is also personal. Would you like to share with us a bit about your diagnosis and how you went from being a patient to a champion for screening? Sure. Okay, so I was diagnosed with stage 3B colorectal cancer in 2021. I went through six months of chemotherapy and within this time frame, I took on um, the challenge of becoming the lead person for our facility um, to increase our colorectal screening uh, rates. Um, they thought I'd be a good fit for it, you know, having the personal history of it. So I'd like to thank you for honoring me with the Survivor Award. Um, and then since you've contacted me, I've added a new title onto that. Um, so I've recently been re-diagnosed with colon cancer again. So I have a recurrent case right now. So um, not only a survival, um, I'm battling it again. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. We're wishing you the best and resending all kinds of healing thoughts as you're going through your treatment. So thank you for being with us on today and just for your incredible advocacy and, and championing the work in, in your day-to-day -day work as well. Thank you. So would you also like to share with us a bit about the kinds of strategies you're using to promote screening both in the clinic and your community? Yes. So um, we're using different strategies to try to reach the population to get our screening rates up. I like to use my personal story, especially with the younger population, those that are between the ages of 45 to 50, um, just to open their eyes and make them realize that this is a real concern and it's not an old person disease. They're at the age where they should be getting screened. So what we're offering is we do the FOBT stool kits and within the last year, we've partnered up with Exact Sciences, and we are now offering the Cologuard for those that meet um, the criteria to get those testing done. And I've had a good response with that. So I'm getting those ordered. We're going out into the community and offering different types of tests. Um, recently, we just had a health fair last Thursday down in our clinic, which was open to the community and to the employees to increase awareness for colorectal cancer screening. Um, we usually get a good turnout with those and we're just gonna continue our efforts by getting out into the community and educating the population on the importance of getting their colorectal screening and giving them the options which they have available to get that done. That is just fantastic. Thank you for that that great work you're doing and you know hearing it the call to screening straight from patients and survivors makes such a, a profound impact. So thank you for that work. Thank um, you. So I wish we had more time for, for discussions with each of our awardees, but before we wrap up this part of the program, I know our audience would be really interested to hear from each of you any advice you have for partners or others that are either just starting out on their work or looking to take their work to the next level with bold goals and ideas. So starting with you, Jennifer, what advice would you share with our listeners? I would really like to um, let people know that the, the work starts with communities, especially for hard to reach communities. We have to talk to our communities and understand their particular barriers. Um, Hispanics have one of the lowest rates of colorectal cancer screening. And so we started by really listening and talking to our communities and understanding what their barriers were. And with that, we had outreach workers who were able to talk to them at their level and provide information that mattered to our population, as well as reducing some of the barriers to access, um, as well as navigation in the system. But working with our community was really vital. And we're proud to have reached uh, an overall uh, um, uptake rate of close to 70 3%, but also noting that our positive fit, we're having people going to colonoscopies close to 90%, which is really unheard of um, when we're looking at data for um, Hispanics in general. Hey, thank you so much for sharing. And, and Chris, what would you like to share? Yeah, I think I, I would want to share four things. Uh, one is 
uh, your your when you're operating at your best, you're finding synergy uh, in a team, uh, and and not to use too much of organizational speak, but but if you can find if you can create an intervention where no single nonprofit, no single for profit could do it alone, that's the best spot to be in because you're that synergistic agent that's bringing together uh, public institutions, private institutions to try to get to try to do something that again no one group can do. That's the spot you want to be in, the, the spot of synergy. Number two, I advise to work in a very focused time period. Uh, a, you know, a year is a very long time to keep up a campaign or intervention. Uh, but if you can focus it to a, a time period, that focused time period creates an energy uh, in and of itself. The third thing is spend a lot of time on data. I mean, data is what is what is shared and can and can be that measure of progress where where people start to feel that momentum of teamwork. And the fourth and final thing is have frequent meetings um, and not just meetings where people show up, but meetings where you are the active engager, like have an MC, a master of ceremonies that's engaging people in the meeting and calling people out who are being quiet. Because at the end of the day, this is a very human inter intervention. It, it's it, Yes, we use data to communicate to each other, but, but pulling each other out and communicating and cross-pollinating, that's the secret to why this stuff works. That is so helpful, thank you. And Makisha, what words of advice or inspiration would you like to share with our audience? So the first and foremost thing that's most important when trying to reach out to those different age groups about the colorectal cancer screening, you need to find information and find ways to educate them that will identify with them personally. So getting on a personal level with the patients, um, we send out letters to each individual that's due with some information on different screening methods. And then also when I do the education, I work with the Native American population. So my education, I try to incorporate Native American foods and different Native American teachings into the ways um, that we're educating them to get screened. So some of the brochures that I have are different foods that are helpful. Um, natural native foods that will help you prevent colon cancer and also some barriers they may have. We find ways to get around those barriers, such as if they're having issues with transportation, we're finding a way to get the kits to them and return back to the facility so that they can get their screenings done. And also our contract health department has been working hand in hand with the facilities and getting these patients to their appointments by giving them the right to and from their appointments to ensure they get these screenings done in a timely manner. So I guess the biggest advice I have is um, be patient, keep working hard and have your goal set to reach out to as many people that you can as possible. And in time, it'll come. Great, thank you so much. And Janamba, are there any takeaways from the work of the your CCP recipients that you'd like to share as inspiration for our audience? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, to echo, echo Dr. Kogel, I would say data matters a lot. Um, I would say do what works, do it well, and partner, 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 <laughs> because nobody can do this by themselves. Um, and I'd like to take a, a second to just thank everyone on this call for their outstanding work all of our recipients, their partner clinics and organizations, um, our program consultant staff here at CDC who supports our recipients and our amazing Dr. Sally Ann Coleman, the medical director for our CRCCP for their dedication and hard work to make these, help support these programs and help support that all the um, clinics and organizations, all the hard work that they're doing out there. So thank you. Yeah, well, thank you all so much. I, there's a lot of themes merging here, I think data, persistence and commitment, um, evidence-based strategies, but also something about the secret sauce and the energy um, that we get from working on something that we're all so passionate about. So really appreciate your work and for sharing with us. So we're gonna hold questions till the end of the program and, and uh, move on to our next panel for now, but please stay with us, our, our awardees and, and Janaba in case we have questions for you towards the end. 
So now I'm pleased to welcome back Caitlin for our last panel. Yeah, thank you so much, Emily. And Makisha, again, thank you for sharing your story and we will be holding you in our hearts and we wish you all the best. Um, this entire program for me has been really energizing. It's been wonderful to hear about such innovative work happening across the country to improve our screening rates and increase um, and improve cancer outcomes. But, you know, as you know, in that same breath, um, it's also hard to ignore the sobering data that was presented earlier. Despite all these monumental achievements, there are many obstacles in our way. But um, I truly feel that the ACS NCCRT is focused and we are ready to do what is needed to address these new and ongoing issues. So I'd like to open the floor to several of our leaders of the ACS NCCRT to share their vision um, of our work moving forward. So please join me in welcoming back ACS NCCRT Chair, Dr. Stephen Itzkowitz, as well as ACS Chair of the Roundtable, Dr. Laura Makaroff, and our newly announced ACS Vice Chair-Elect, Dr. Gloria Coronado. Welcome, everyone. So Steve, I would like to start with you. So as you mentioned earlier, the ACS NCCRT has achieved so much in the last 28 years by making audacious goals and taking bold action. I'd like to get your thoughts on what you see as next for ACS NCCRT as we look ahead. What is your vision for us moving forward and what might possibly be our next bold step as a roundtable? Yeah, thanks, Caitlin. So I think the strengths of the roundtable is what we've been doing for the last 28 years, and that is bringing people together and looking at our own communities, our own micro environment, and taking from all of our resources and our toolkits what you can do to apply to increase screening rates where you work. Uh, because although it takes a collective, it really comes down to the one-on-one -on -one with your patients and with your clinics. Um, so we have to continue, we have to really amp our game because we know that there's still huge disparities related to race and ethnicity, socioeconomic status, uh, et cetera. But as we do our work in screening, and I think we're really good at it, and we've broken down policy barriers, but as we do all of that work and we have to sustain that, the thing that keeps us grounded are these rates of mortality and incidence. And Becky Siegel's presentation is sobering. When we look at increased rates of mortality, increased rates of incidence in certain populations, that's not supposed to happen. And we don't understand all the reasons why, but we really have to try to think more broadly beyond screening as to why are people dying of this disease still? Why are they still getting diagnosed with cancers uh, before they occur? So that's a bold mission to start undertaking things like lowering mortality. There's lots of factors that go into that, but we're starting to think along those lines. Yeah, thank you. And, you know, as a roundtable, champions are everything. And you you threw your great examples of that. And um, I think that's such a good point. Um, Laura, I'd like to ask you the same question. What is your vision for the ACS NCCRT in the upcoming years? And where do you see opportunities for us to evolve our work in bold and meaningful ways? Yeah, thank you. And thank you to all of our um, presenters today and for all of our audience um, participants. Um, you know, it really takes um, a village or a community, as we say, to make a difference in communities. So really appreciate everyone joining us today. You know, I think um, Dr. Iskowitz and our other presenters have made really important points about um, our partnerships and the real value that, you know, an organization like the NCCRT, that's an organization of organizations, can make really great progress. And we've heard and seen you know, such tremendous progress in increasing screening rates, although still challenges, right? You know, we're still facing significant disparities and gaps in equitable access and uptake of screening. And so there's more progress to be made overall. And specifically, you know, more progress and things that we can do um, as the NCCRT for people um, ages 45 to 54, and even maybe younger for those who may have other hereditary risks or other risk factors that make them eligible for screening um, earlier, earlier ages. And then I think that, you know, the trends that um, Becky Siegel shared with us and what our ACS Cancer Facts and Figures publication showed with this rising um, incidence and the rapid shifts in mortality patterns in adults under 50 is such an important call to action for the ACS NCCRT and the colorectal cancer community. You know, really see us having an opportunity to take a larger step into addressing the issues and challenges that are beyond screening, while also continuing our focus and not abandoning that focus on getting to 80% screening in every community. So I am excited about the future and what we have um, to come and the, the work that we'll be doing through this upcoming summit will work that we're going to host 
this summer as a first step in bringing some partners together, um, both new and current partners together to identify um, what might be our first steps um, in some new priorities beyond screening. So more information to come on that for sure, but I think that you know we have um, an opportunity to really um, make a big difference um, across the um, colorectal cancer continuum to build on our successes and our progress in screening, but also to recognize that there's other challenges that really um, are so compelling that we, we must um, do something and we have an opportunity to come together in some new ways. Yes, I totally agree. And I'm also very much looking forward to just exploring what our new role is in this space across the continuum. So yes, more information to be shared soon. So one of the reasons that the ACS NCCRT has been able to stay relevant for so many years, I mean, nearly three decades, is because our members and our key volunteers, they help us to identify new and needed areas of focus. Um, I wanna talk a bit about the importance of those that really drive our work. So Dr. Uh, so Gloria, you have been a longtime volunteer of the ACS NCCRT and worn many hats. Um, and so now as our new vice chair elect, what do you feel the, the role that member organizations play in all of this? Yeah, so many, so many opportunities and, and certainly the role of member organizations has been really critical to the mission of NCCRT. I first want to just echo kind of my reaction to kind of the data that was just shared by Rebecca Siegel and the fact that over 20% of the cases of colorectal cancer are now occurring among individuals who are younger than 55 and how important it is for us to really understand what is driving that. Um, and I think there will be some really exciting opportunities for us to kind of push an agenda to really advance research on understanding why incidence is increasing in the younger population so that we can focus our efforts on screening, but also um, making sure that we're understanding those risk factors so that we can also focus on prevention. Um, I think that member organizations have been critical that we can continue to engage organizations across a broad range of interests. So we have some really great patient advocacy organizations, as well as clinical organizations, um, as well as um, industries that are really advancing technology around testing. Um, and so I think that uh, continuing to recruit diverse organizations into the NCCRT so that we can really advance that mission of reaching 80% in every community will be important. Yes, wonderful, absolutely. And we are getting close on time, so I am going to skip a few of our questions and um, ask you, Steve. So before we move on to Q&A, because we've been getting some really great questions in the, um, the Q&A box, you've outlined our current priorities as a roundtable, and we just talked about these incredible opportunities that lie ahead. I'd love to get your thoughts on what um, colorectal cancer partners in the field and members can start to do now to address some of these issues, whether it be screening rates, early age onset colorectal cancer or disparities in other areas across the continuum? I think one of the most important things people can do uh, is to really go to our website where we have a tremendous number of resources. <clears throat> we just published a lead time messaging guidebook, which uh, is based on very uh, excellent market research. What messages can you use to get across to young people, to people in uh, various racial and ethnic minority groups? So we have a lot of resources. Nobody should feel that they have to reinvent the wheel or develop things on their own. And one of the messages that has come across time and again in our marketing research is that many patients don't get screened because their doctor never suggested it. The doctor never brought it up. And I think whatever environment we work in, we have to even educate our providers to bring it up, to talk about it, and not to talk about it when somebody turns 45, but to talk about it earlier than that so that people are primed by the time they're 45 and certainly older, that they get screened. So please use our resources, talk to people. We're, we're all around the country very experienced in this. We just have to get to do it, just get the job done. And the resources are there. Thank you so much, Steve. And we have had so many wonderful questions come in the Q&A, but we have one minute left. So what we'll do is we'll collect these, we'll share them with our panelists and try to send that out in a follow-up email to everyone who registered. Again, thank you so much to all of our wonderful panelists. This has been an incredibly inspiring hour together. Um, I want to acknowledge um, the stories shared, the work that's being done across the nation and across many of these organizations. Um, it's clear that there's a lot of work to do, but we are geared up and we are ready for it. And I am so appreciative of all of you sharing your time with us. 
I want to thank our panelists. I want to thank our awardees. I also want to thank those who helped um, pull this production together. Emily Bell, Aubrey Thielen, and Megan Burns. And as a reminder, please fill out the evaluation that you're seeing in the chat box. We will also share a recording and a link to our evaluation and a follow-up email along with all of these Q&A questions. So again, thank you so much. Happy March. And we look forward to hearing from you soon. Thanks.